All right, so for the last part of uh, the lecture today, um, we're going to talk about reading fluency. And it's important to see reading fluency is really a combination uh, of all of those foundational reading skills we talked about in the last lecture. Um, so it's when your phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, um, decoding skills all come together to, um, to read a text in front of you. Fluency is defined as the ability to read text accurately, at an appropriate pace, and with expression. I think often um, kids and teachers alike think about uh, reading fluency as how fast someone can read a text. Um, and that's a part of it, but accuracy and expression are also important components. In the LEMS article, um, they define fluency as the ability to recognize words and simultaneously construct meaning from connected text. So they even add this, <clears throat> this dimension of comprehension and meaning making from word recognition. So <clears throat> fluency really encompasses these two um, components, automaticity and prosody. Automaticity is just, just the ability to recognize words and identify them correctly. Okay, so decoding a word accurately on the page. Whereas prosody is about how you put those words together. Um, how you know proper intonation, appropriate phrasing, where to put stress, what type of expression to read if there's dialogue or um, if there's a question versus a statement. That's prosody, and that's um, an equally important part of reading fluency. So think for a moment about how fluency is connected to other language processes. Decoding, comprehension. Um, as we saw, if we, we think back to that um, rope image and all of the different threads that are wound together to form the rope of proficient reading, um, you see how all of these components are uh, intertwined and, and dependent upon one another. Quick note about fluency um, and how we typically see it in the classroom. If you are, again, an elementary teacher or possibly a special education teacher, you probably assess um, reading fluency in your classroom. And the way that fluency is typically assessed um, is orally. You'll often have uh, a teacher sitting with a student, listening to a student read a section of text out loud, taking a, a running record where they're um, tabulating the number of errors and types of errors a student is making, um, counting the number of words they've read within a particular time period, and this, this all happens orally. But fluency um, encompasses silent reading as well, and sometimes we take this for granted. Silent fluent reading takes place when students automatically recognize and decode words um, and process text with comprehension in their heads. And this is, this is ultimately the, the type of reading that we as adults do all the time, that we do in college, that we do in careers, and this is the type of reading we want students to be able to do. Um, <clears throat> the silent fluent reading typically begins toward the end of first grade for many students, um, although again this will be different for um, uh, students who, who may not have learned to read right away or um, learning to read in a new language. So I want you to take a moment to reflect on your own reading fluency. And to do that, I want you to take, uh, to pause the recording here and try reading this text out loud. Now this is a, a passage in German. Um, if, you, if you speak German, um, or you've taken German before, this may not work as well for you. Um, you may have already developed some reading fluency in German, but I'm assuming most of you are not fluent German speakers. <clears throat> so try decoding this text, try reading it out loud. Um, and after you've done that, I want you to reflect on what did you notice about your prosody? Uh, what did it, how did you know where to um, chunk phrases of text? What intonation or what expression to use in different parts of the text? Okay, pause the recording now. Take a moment to read it out loud. So what happened? What did you notice? What happened to your prosody? Were you able to read with expression? 
Um, were you able to put, you know, to know what type of intonation to read with or where to change your expression? It was probably pretty difficult for you. And so when you struggle to decode, um, when you struggle to identify words in print, it's difficult to read with expression and with fluidity. When you think about the sort of traditional way that we assess fluency, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's typically assessed orally, there are some challenges that come with uh, fluency assessment for ELLs. Using oral reading fluency assessments can be problematic with ELLs for a number of reasons. Um, they may mispronounce words, uh, and that mispronunciation can relate to language differences. Differences in sounds between languages, accents that are different, um, rather than decoding difficulties. But if you've ever given a running record, you know that if a student miscues, if a student says the wrong word, a word that's not on the paper, um, doesn't decode a word correctly, you mark it as an error. So you can imagine that this would be challenging for ELL. They may mispronounce a word um, or, or read a word with a different accent, and a teacher could interpret this as a decoding error, when in fact it's not. Uh, similarly, if ELLs are struggling with pronunciation, um, this can slow them down, uh, which can lead them to have overall lower fluency scores. Their, their words per minute may be less. And this doesn't necessarily mean that they are decoding poorly or that they're not comprehending that they read what they read, um, but on paper their score may be lower. So it's really important that uh, teachers sort of understand these challenges that are inherent in oral fluency assessments with the LLs, and that they balance this oral reading performance with um, deeper assessments of ELLs reading comprehension ability to help them choose appropriate texts at their level. It's also important for teachers to be aware of and consider pronunciation differences when assessing reading accuracy. Um, so that you know if there are wor if there are sounds and pronunciation differences, for example, between Spanish and English. And if you hear a student uh, make one of those pronunciation differences, um, to know that that may not be a miscue. It may not be a decoding challenge, but it may just be a difference in pronunciation. And so you wouldn't necessarily dock a student um, for making an error. On the next slide, there's a list of some of the most common pronunciation differences between English and Spanish. Take a moment to look through those and think about whether you've observed any of these in your students' speech or in their reading. So here's a list. This is uh, scanned from a, a photo of a book, so I apologize for the um, quality of the image. But you can see some of the differences here, both in consonant sounds and vowel sounds. So what do you think? Have you seen any of these differences in your Spanish-speaking students? Were you aware that these were differences in um, pronunciation and sounds not transferring across languages? This is important to consider as you're listening to students read and assessing their fluency. So, despite these challenges um, of oral reading and fluency assessment, research still shows that fluency instruction is beneficial for ELLs, but, but perhaps for different reasons than it is for native English speakers. So why do you think fluency instruction and practice can be beneficial for ELLs? Your readings touched on this a bit this week. Here are some of those benefits. Fluency instruction for ELLs and fluency practice gives them an opportunity to practice chunking or phrasing, to practice prosody, okay, that appropriate expression and intonation, and that's a skill they need for all language domains, okay, to comprehend what they're hearing, to speak, to interact. Um, <clears throat> also, expressive reading assists with comprehension and it can help to highlight important words for ELLs. If they're reading with expression, it means that they know what words and phrases are important in the text, ultimately. Um, repeated readings that, that are the bedrock of most fluency interventions help ELLs um, secure new words in their long-term memory. 
if a student is practicing a passage over and over and over again, um, they are getting many at bats, many exposures to new words, um, and those are it's helping them to stick. And this ultimately helps ELLs grow their sight word vocabulary, um, and that's going to be necessary for fluent reading in the long run. Fluency instruction also builds stamina and can boost confidence and motivation. When a student's practiced reading a passage multiple times and sees themselves getting uh, faster at it, more confident, more comfortable, um, their motivation grows and they, they become more confident readers. Fluency instruction ultimately increases reading rate, and this will allow ELLs to process more text, be exposed to more words in English, and hopefully become better overall readers and, and more engaged, invested readers as well. Because you can imagine that if you struggle with fluency, um, you struggle to decode, you struggle to make meaning, your motivation is going to be pretty low and you're not going to comprehend much of what you read. So your sort of closing activity for um, this week's online module is to read overviews of seven different fluency strategies, seven different instructional strategies you can use in the classroom to promote and practice reading fluency. Um, some of these are going to be really familiar. You probably use some of them in your class. Others may be new. Um, again, if you are an elementary teacher, you are more likely to have used some of these um, in your classroom. These may be newer for middle and high school teachers, but they can absolutely still benefit um, your students, especially your ELLs and your struggling readers. So the seven strategies you're going to read about are shared reading, paired reading, poetry performance, reader's theater, phrased text lesson, follow my lead, and echo echo. Your, your final activity, your job um, to close out this session is after you read through these seven strategies, select two of them that you particularly like and write a one to two page response that answers the following questions. How concretely would you implement this strategy in your class? Why would this strategy be beneficial for ELLs in particular? And what ELD levels in particular would this strategy be most helpful for and why? So be sure to post that um, assignment up to Blackboard in order to finish out this week's online module. The last thing I want to touch on before we end the session is your assignment coming up uh, that is due for next week, for next Tuesday's class. Um, so this week you'll, you won't be doing another lesson plan, uh, but instead you'll be doing this uh, selecting informational texts assignment. And here's what you're going to do for this assignment. You're going to pick two grade appropriate informational texts. Okay, this would be appropriate for your students, in your content area, your class, um, and, and particularly for, for English language learners. Okay? Um, and you're going to, for each of those two texts, write a written rationale for why you selected the text, um, which is informed by course readings. So you should, you know, in places that are appropriate, cite course readings. And in this rationale, you, you should include the name of the text, a proper citation for the text, the target grade, um, topic and standards that you're addressing, um, an explanation of why this, these texts are appropriate to students' reading abilities and English proficiency levels, language and content objectives um, that you would be using this text for, and a statement about how you might provide opportunities for your students to engage uh, or interact with the text. Be sure also to include um, a reference list at the end with the citations for um, your texts. You're going to um, ultimately post these rationales as assignment to Blackboard, um, but also bring copies of your texts to class for next week um, to share them out and be prepared to discuss them in small groups. If you have them electronically and just want to bring them on your computer, totally fine. Um, you can also bring hard copies of the texts if they're in books or, or on paper. Um, in the Blackboard online module folder, I'm going to put um, an exemplar of the 
informational text assignment and the rubric so you can review that. Be sure to reach out to me if you have any questions about this assignment before you submit it for next week. Um, and you can find the assignment Dropbox in the assignments section of Blackboard, same place where you've submitted your lesson plan so far. Okay, so again, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions you have about this assignment. And uh, to close out, here's a summary of your next steps. Um, we will be in person for week nine next week, uh, March 31st, and it will be reading part two. Um, there are slightly different readings for um, each of the sections, although you'll both be reading Gibbons articles. Um, there will be a discussion board post that will be coming up for these readings. And again, your assignment that is due for Tuesday will be your informational text selection and rationale. All right, I hope everybody has a great week and be sure to um, submit all of your posts and pieces for this online module by end of day on Friday. Uh, see you on the 31st. Bye.